I wanted to get on record a little bit some of the stories I've got from my deer camps. I've had many deer camps over the years. I moved to Georgia down in about right around 1992. Got into deer camps right off the bat. Thought I was going to kill every deer in the state. Uh, learned a hard lesson. Took me almost a year to kill a deer down there. You kill a buck a day, every day from August 15th to January 1st. And I struggled. I struggled hard. And uh, one of the things I absolutely loved about Georgia was the camps, the deer camps. I drove three hours to get to my camp in Talbot County from Marietta and uh, had some of the greatest guys. I don't know some great guys. Good friend was named uh, Richard Stevens. Absolutely loved this guy. He was a blast. Old retired guy. Uh, been worked for mobile. He was uh, retired and working for these little uh, fleet vehicle maintenance uh, places. And kind of struggling with that. But uh, he and I did a lot of hunting together. Many, many camps. Some of the stories we've got just are just too. One of Richard's best friends has been hunting with him longer than I had is uh, Lonnie True Love. Lonnie was a particular individual. He was retired, he was on fixed income, but he wasn't hurting for money. Had a really nice house. But everything Lonnie did, he did on the cheap. He was a compromise, it was a half ass. And we just gave him utter hell for it. Um, we got into a club in uh, 800 acres down in Dooley County, and uh, we were surrounded on three sides by soybean fields. And uh, the road getting in there was sugar sand, and when the uh, when it rained, that water table came right up to the to the surface, and you could stand on it, move your feet like this, and just sink right in like quicksand. It was really crazy. I got stuck in there. Went to get the farmer to pull me out. Got his big tractor stuck, but. Uh, Lonnie, of course, had a truck, but it was two-wheel drive because he half-assed it, so we'd give Lonnie utter hell about that truck and uh, asking him why he's so afraid of four-wheel drive. And uh, he uh, always had a reason for it. He, instead of a four-wheeler, he bought a golf cart. It was a Yamaha gas engine one. He tried hooking these Home Depot implements up to it when the rest of us had got little toy tractors and, and uh, you know we're pulling real implements. He's pulling these damn Home Depot specials, just crap breaking, his golf cart smoking like crazy. You couldn't even ride behind him. Uh, he called that the true love of Valdez. And uh, everything he did was just half-assed. And uh, he's very particular about killing the big buck. He, he, he done well. He's killed a lot of bucks in his time. But he would not kill anything during the season until like the last day, and then he'd turn around and say, I've got to kill a doe, I've got to kill, and there's no does to be found. He built this stand out in a cornfield at this club. We had, uh, it was out I-20 on an old farm. He called it the confessional. It was a little square or rectangular shooting house, but he had it so that he closed the windows completely up, and he sat in there in the complete dark in the heat, sweated his ass off, and then he'd open up a window just a little bit and peek out, and then he'd close the window back again. Ridiculous way to hunt. And uh, he used to get so pissed at Richard, because Richard and I built a big tower stand, and uh, it was three foot square at the top, and then we built a house on top of that that was four foot square. And uh, it was all the comforts you want, big tin roof on it. Um, and Richard, you know, he was, he was getting old, but he had a Kawasaki mule. Well, he would park that mule, drive it in and park it right underneath that, that stand, and which would drive Lonnie insane. Lonnie would tell me, say, you're scaring every damn deer in the whole property out of here. Every time you drive in there, every time Richard would go in there, he'd kill a deer or two. And uh, most of the time, he'd come back to the camp with a deer, and Lonnie would throw his hat down, and Richard would say, you know where I shot this at, Lonnie? And uh, I don't want to know. And uh, Richard would say, yeah, you know where my mule was parked? I don't want to know. He said, you know what I did right before I shot it? I took a leak right out the door. <laughs> so then Lonnie sitting out in his, his uh, confessional out there in the cornfield, couldn't see a thing. And Richard's, you know, whizzing out the door and making all kind of noise and just slaying him out of that stand. And that was kind of the, the whole thing with Lonnie over the years. And uh, 
it was fun with him. I, these old men, somebody brought some moonshine back. And uh, we were in Dooley County. And uh, I think it was Richard brought it back from Tennessee or someplace. But it was moonshine, but it had been aged in old oak casks. It had a kind of a, a caramel color to it. And uh, it was actually, it didn't taste bad. Um, we sat down after hunting all day, and these guys had their meals all set, and I was eating my Denny Moore stew. And, and uh, they started uh, playing cards. They were passing this just little pint of moonshine around. And it got to me. I took a couple sips out of it, and I just kept passing on the next guy. Probably six or eight of us sitting around the table. And uh, got to Lonnie. You know, Lonnie take a sip of it and pass it on. Got to the point where nobody was sipping on it except for Lonnie. He was the only one who kept sipping. Everyone else was just pretending and winking at each other. And Lonnie kept sipping it and sipping it. <laughs> and uh, night went on. The card game got pretty raucous. And, and uh, Lonnie said, well, fellas, I said, I, I got to go to bed. And uh, we were under a pop-up canopy we had and uh so Lonnie stood up he took a took a step hooked his arm on the pole did a 360 came around plopped back down and his face slapped right down into his mashed potatoes and uh and he was out and uh and we were just rolling on the ground and uh so Lonnie gets up after a minute and, and uh he kind of wipes stuff off his face and he he starts staggering trying to get to his to his camper, and he had a little little deck built up about four inches off the ground, and uh, he hit that face down right on the deck. And we're just howling, and uh, we we're gonna leave him there all night and just let him sleep on his deck. But Richard said, oh, "I'll put him to bed." So Richard got up and got him in there and threw him into bed. And uh, next morning, that was about noon when Lonnie got up. The rest of us went hunting. Lonnie gets back, up out of bed, comes out, and he's just. Looked like someone combed his hair with a boot. And he comes out and he says, holy crap, he says, uh, he says, uh, how did I get to bed last night? And uh, we all said, why, well, we don't know. And he says, and who the hell took my pants off? <laughs> so, I just, uh, I miss those guys, it was a lot of fun. I used to call them a bunch of drunken college kids, all the shenanigans that they used to do. But uh, Lonnie was a character, he had very, very specific ideas about deer hunting and boy you violate any one of those and he'd just have a fit and he'd let you know about it and uh so we took great joy in in violating his thousand rules of deer hunting and, and killing deer in spite of them and uh had a lot of fun with him and for all the 15 years that i was in georgia i belonged to a hunting club called the uh, uh delta club it was formed by a bunch of uh delta pilots out of Atlanta, and uh, I don't think there were many there when I got in there. The club was getting kind of old. It's a beautiful piece of property when I first saw it, and I joined. And I think the reason there were openings was because they came in and they were they were clear cutting this this three thousand acres, and clear cutting huge swaths of it. Um, Forty five members on three thousand acres. Um, usually, I had a camper down there. It's three hours away from. Uh, from my home so I go down Friday night and uh, I'd spend the whole weekend down there come back Sunday night um, after I hunted loved that camp it was great but a lot of guys but after uh, they'd all be down there the first weekend and uh, they'd all be down there Thanksgiving and other than that I pretty much had 3,000 acres all myself and uh, loved it I was all over that place um, Beautiful creek ran down through the middle, old, ancient, white oak bottoms. Really amazing stuff. Um, but the group of people we had in there were just absolute characters. We had um, a bunch of old men again, which was just a, a blast to hang out with. And uh, so they'd come down there and, and uh, they'd have all kinds of food and just coolers and pies and stuff their wives would make up for them. And, and they camped down there with us on the weekend when they come down. And uh, they hunted during the week and then let us guys hunt the weekends. So they, uh, once in a while, I'd take a week off and go down there and, and uh, they'd hunt with those guys. It was just a blast. But they, uh, 
you get them going once they get a couple beers in them sitting around a fire at night and uh you know, I'd say something just to, just to get them going, saying, you know, the, there's not a single snake in the entire state of Georgia. And, oh, Lord, the, the, the story's coming. And just going on and on and on about these snakes and stuff. Just get them to riled up. And uh, one night we were sitting there, and one of the old men said, we can start talking about the logging operations going on. He says, when I was a boy, we climbed on top of those trees. He said, my job was to go up there, cut the top of that tree off. He said, and... Uh, and as it fell over, I would jump on it and ride it to the ground, just like a parachute, and hit the ground and then climb up the next tree and do that. One of the younger guys there just called bullshit. He said, that's the biggest crock of crap I've ever heard. And they argued back and forth and back and forth, and, and uh, finally the old man says, well, I'm going to prove it to you. And uh, so he, <laughs> he runs across uh, where the fire is, starts climbing up this tree that's no, no more than about that big around and he's climbing up this pine and he gets up i don't know maybe eight nine feet he's shimmying up this tree and we're just looking at him like what the hell are you doing the tree starts to bend over you know it's bending over bending over it gets about where he's he's parallel to the ground hanging on to this thing with his feet and his arms and we're just howling and uh he's like i can't hold on i can't hold on and he let go and fell flat on his back <laughs> laid there and said fellas I think I'm hurt, and <laughs> we went over and helped him up. But that's just the kind of insane crap went on around that fire. Um, I was in my camper one night. They all stay up all night long. I go to bed around I don't know, nine o'clock or so. So they're all down around the fire, and they're they're getting lit, and they're laughing and, and carrying on. All of a sudden, I hear this hooting and hollering and yelling, and they all go running past my camper down the road. I was down on the end of the campground. They go running past my camper. I hear them going way down in the woods, down to the creek bottom down there, and then I hear shooting, pow, 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 pow. I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to kill each other down there. And uh, I didn't hear anything else out of that. I turned the air conditioner on my camper and went to bed. The uh, next day, I was like, what in the hell were you all doing last night? And they, said they were sitting around that fire, and an uh, armadillo ran right through the middle of them, right past the fire. And they all looked at each other and said, let's get them. And so they all jumped up and took off running after him, drunk, carrying weapons down into the creek bottom, shooting at this armadillo. Why, I don't know. But this is the kind of crazy crap they would do. Um, never a dull moment down there around these, these campfires. We had these two rednecks down there in uh, Talbot County. They had joined, and, and uh, they bought a little little uh, coon hound, and they were going to teach him to track deer. It was just a little tiny puppy, cutest little thing. And uh, they'd tie him out to a tree all night, and he'd sit behind their camper, and he'd be out there barking and barking and barking. And one of them barks that just put me to sleep. I loved that, having that little dog down there. He's a cute little thing. These two guys, they had this whole thing they were going to do to teach this dog how to how to track deer, how to track a wounded deer. So they killed a dove, brought it back to the camp that evening. They had it hung up on the on the hoist on the gambrel, and uh, they gutted it out, skinned it out. They took the tail off, and uh, they brought that puppy over there. They both kneeled down in front of that puppy, and uh, they were holding that tail out there, and they, they were saying, you know, get a smell, boy, get a smell, boy. Get smell, boy. And that little puppy's just kind of looking at both of them and looking at that tail. He just reaches out and just grabs that tail and takes off running through the woods with those two guys behind him just screaming, get back here, boy. And uh, just hilarious. I could hear him go way out through the woods. That little dog's just hauling ass, just taking off for the next county. And those two guys <laughs> tearing off after him, trying to catch that poor little puppy with a deer tail in his mouth. <laughs> and... Uh, and they finally brought him back, and they all oh, they were mad. They they tied him up to a tree, and they and they said they were the dumbest dog they ever said. This is the smartest dog I've ever seen. I said, you give him something to eat, he's gonna take it and go find some place to put it. But, uh, I don't think they ever made a deer tracking dog out of him. Uh, rather than take him down in the woods and have him actually track, you know, a wounded deer, they trying some other kind of crazy crap. But funny to watch those guys. They they were a riot. They always had something going on. Those two, and uh, 
the little puppy. Well, he was the best. We had a group of brothers down there. There was two brothers and a cousin or two. They all had a little area up there in the campground near the entrance in Talbot County where, where they all had their campers up there. They were, they were a tight bunch. Good hunters. I mean, they, they really put the time and the effort in. Um, but, man, I'll tell you, they just couldn't stay out. We were probably an hour and a half out of uh, uh, Columbus, Georgia. And uh, there was a nudie bar out there. And those guys, Saturday night, never fail. They take off, and, and this kid, Red, I think his name was, he had a huge jacked-up um, Bronco, one of the full-size Broncos. They all load up in that thing, go off to the nudie bar. Well, Sunday morning, they weren't back yet. And uh, I said, well, that's not good. Hoping they didn't drive off into a ditch somewhere and get themselves killed. But uh, they came back in Sunday night and told me the story of what had happened. They were down there drinking, and uh, they were going to head back Saturday night, and then they decided they were... They were at the nudie bar, and they decided they'd stop at, at uh, Burger King. And so the Burger King in there was up on a hill, had a long bank that went down, and uh, went down to the red light where the intersection was. Well, they are what they are. They jumped in there, and, and old Red said, he said, you know, F this, I'm, I'm, I'm not driving down there. He went straight through the bushes on the edge of the parking lot, the Burger King, down the hill, dragging bushes all the way down, over the curve, down through the red light, and right there sitting was a was a cop. The cop chases him down. He's drunk. They're all drunk, so nobody can drive. So they park the truck, and uh, Red gets hauled off to jail. They told Red, they said, well, you know, we'll go um, get a hotel. We'll, we'll uh, you know, we'll give you a call. We'll come back and get you and bail you out. Well, they went back, found a hotel, fell asleep, forgot about Red, left him in the, in the jail all night long. Didn't realize it until the next morning. Got up, went and got him out. He about beat their asses, and uh, <laughs> Red was not a small guy. But uh, the kind of idiocy that goes on, they would go there and they'd pick up girls and they'd bring them back to the hunting camp. It was just, it was insane. These guys were, they were out of control. Um, but other than that, great guys. I had a lot of fun with them. Um, you know, anybody that, that's a serious hunter and really puts the time into scouting and finds the spots and tries to figure out what's going on in that property, I, I really get along well with them. Uh, and I never went to Columbus with those guys, but I knew what kind of trouble we'd be getting into. And uh, down in Talbot County, the group of old men that were down there, you know, they were just fascinated with me because I did any more stew every night. And... Uh, so they asked me one night, we're sitting around a the campfire, they had Cornish hens and pans of cornmeal muffins, they had everything in the smoker, and their wives had mixed up all their stuff for them, they had pies, they had just, it was amazing, the food that they would bring down. They ate like kings, and I'm just eating out of a can. And so they feel sorry for me every once in a while, and make me something up. And uh, one guy, he says, uh, he says, Keith, you got a, you got a woman. And I said, yes, sir. I said, I've been living with this girl for 10 years. And uh, he says, 10 years? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, you going to marry her? I said, I've got no plans on it. He says, uh, well, she, uh, you know, she keep a good house? And I said, no, nah, not really. I said, she's a, she's a mess. I said, I do most of the, you know, keeping stuff cleaned up. And he says, well, do, uh, is she a good cook? I said, no, nah, she can't cook anything. I said, uh, normally go out he's looking at me and just shaking his head he goes i don't understand he says uh he says now he thought about it for a while and sat there and then he says you know i'm not one to you know tell another man how to live his life but you need to dispatch that woman immediately and uh i laughed and i said what'd you say that for he says well he says when all the, the fooling around is all done the only thing you're going to have left is the cooking and the cleaning he said, I'm here to tell you right now, you need to dispatch that woman immediately. And uh, it's kind of the fun stuff these guys <laughs> would tell me. <laughs> I was, they had no idea what was going on and uh, how I kept this stuff to going together for 10 years. Because I'd uh, tell my girlfriend, I'd start growing a beard 
about uh, oh, about a month before deer season. And uh, I told her, I said, you know, deer season every weekend from August 15th to January 1st, I'm going to be at the hunting camp. And so I leave my dog there at the house and she watches dogs. And I told her, I said, you know, the rest of the year is yours. Every weekend we will do whatever you want to do. And uh, when I start growing that beard, and she'd look at me and go, I guess hunting season's coming up. And I said, yep, next month. And uh, then she realized that, you know, she'd squandered all summer and uh, hadn't made me go do anything. Because I told her, I said, I'll do whatever you want to do. I don't care what it is, where you want to go, we'll go and do it. And uh, the summer's yours, but hunting season's mine. So she kind of was getting pissy about it. She came in one day and she says, um, we're going to go to the Renaissance Festival this weekend. And I said, I have no idea what that is. I said, but it's your weekend. Sure, we'll go, we'll go to the Renaissance Festival. And I really think she thought she was going to torture me with this thing. Um, so we go there and it's park out in the field. You walk down into these woods, old woods and hard woods, and they've got a dang gum village like a fort built down in there and uh so we go in the in the front gate and there's little boys running around with king hats on and wooden swords and they're beating the crap out of each other and little girls running around with their princess hats on and everybody these kids running everywhere and i was like well this is pretty cool so we go in and uh first thing i see on the left hand side is you know, ye old tavern and uh Big old huge pints of this, you know, oatmeal stuff. <laughs> I get a great big old beer. So I'm loving it. I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I've got a beer. And uh, so we start walking around. There's guys in there selling pickles, um, you know, all dressed up in old, you know, medieval outfits and stuff. And, and uh, jugglers and all this crazy crap going on around. And, and I'm drinking my second stout. And uh, this girl comes up. She's dressed up in the old... You know, she's got the low-cut uh, blouse on and the dress. She comes up to my girlfriend and says, Excuse me, uh, madam, might I borrow your squire? And uh, so Sarah kind of laughed at her and said, You know, sure. And she says, Well, I'm the kissing wench. And uh, she said, I'll kiss for a dollar. <laughs> I said, okay, that sounds great. So I'll pull a dollar out, and she puts a lipstick on and gives me a big kiss. And... Uh, so I put a hand with a dollar. She goes, no, no, no. And she does this. And she goes, here. <laughs> I said, I love the Renaissance Festival. This is great. So I'm sticking the dollar bill in there. My girlfriend is just getting livid. And uh, this was meant to torture me. And she took me to like the greatest place in the world for guys to go. It was just phenomenal. They had jousting and, um, I mean, real stuff. Where they, uh, real stuff, but and uh, beating the crap out of each other, and, and horses running up and down, and, and uh, it was just a, a blast. I had such a good time there. And uh, I think it was the last time she made me go somewhere, um, other than one of the parties she made me go to. But that was my, my one thing time I had to pay for, for going to a hunt all year long, but uh, it kind of backfired on her. But uh, that, that thing was awesome. Ever want to see a Renaissance Festival? Go, you're gonna have a blast. There was one time that Richard and Lonnie and I were scouting, and uh, you know, Richard and Lonnie were always fighting like an old married couple, and uh, Lonnie's always just paranoid. They, these, these guys saw snakes every single time they went in the woods. I never saw a snake. I think the whole time I was in Georgia, I saw one snake, it was on the road. They'd see copperheads, they'd see you know, you know, cane brakes, timber rattlers. They just Every time they go out, they'd see a snake. They were terrified of them. And I told them, I said, you guys are just looking for these damn things. I don't look for them. I never see them. And I spend way more time in the woods than they did. It, uh, so we were going down. Lonnie wanted to take a look at this, this one area. And uh, so he was leading, and, and uh, Richard was behind him, and I was behind Richard. We're kind of single file. And uh, we're going through. There's a big tree, and there's an old um, property line there. It was a barbed wire fence. We kept falling down. Lonnie steps over the fence 
on these steps, the one of the wires was caught and came up and smacked him right in the back of the calf. It hit him hard. And uh, Richard said, Lonnie, don't move. Cane break. Lonnie just starts shaking. And he said, don't move, don't move. And Lonnie's saying, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And uh, he says, I can't. He's, he's moving. He's, he's getting too close to your foot. And uh, he said, don't move, don't move. And this went on for like three minutes until Lonnie finally looked down and saw that it was just a barbed wire sitting up there. And then Richard busted out, and we busted out laughing. And, well, Lonnie was pissed. But uh, to, you know, that quick on your feet to, to mess with somebody was priceless. I belong to a lot of clubs in Georgia. We got into one down in Macon, and um, it was uh, 450 acres. It'd been clear cut. It was it was a mess, uh, but you know it's very tough finding a, a, um, a hunting club in that county because that's where most of the trophies in Georgia came from, and uh, very very desirable uh, to have a club there and be able to hunt. And I found one, so I went down there, and it, it was. A, it was a mess. I was only there for a couple of years. They um, took me down there, walked me around, kind of showed me the, the, the club and the, what the president did. So we went down into a little finger of woods that came down. He said, I want to show you something. He says, you know, you, could, you can use this stand if you want to. He says, we call this the man stand. And uh, I said, okay. So we walked down there. It was this tree that had not been cleared. It was huge old tree kind of went up in a in a v it was two trees like this way up in the top of this thing they had nailed these two by fours across and had a seat sitting on it but when i say up there i mean it was up there the uh and they had nails the, the big old spikes in the tree to, to climb up this thing and to get up there and uh the president of the club said yeah he says it's uh i've been up there and i dropped one of those big tape measures down on the reels. He said 76 feet from the ground to that that seat. And he said, you can see the entire valley from there. He said, if you want to hunt that, you know, you can hunt that. And I said, good God, you know, sitting on two by four, 76 feet in the air, it, insane. But I mean, this is kind of stuff these people did. And they, uh, I tried doing the best I could at that camp. I mean, I, I went down and found an area where nobody hunted because it was just completely overgrown with briars. So I took my tractor in there and I bush hogged these briars out. And I'm going around. And I'm going to make a food plot down in there. So bush hogging this area out. And I can see there's some trash or something in the middle of this, these briars. And uh, I get closer and closer. And it, so I'm moving my way in. And I look and it's a um, Coleman cooler with no lid on it. And uh, I was like, oh, got a little closer, a little closer, and, and uh, I see there's a path going into it. So I get off, walk down in there. In this Coleman cooler, this thing's full of little marijuana plants about you know, 10 inches tall. The little whole thing. <laughs> Holy crap. So I picked that up. I threw that down into the creek. Went back, asked the, um, the club president. I said, you know, how's your crop of pot doing this year? And uh, he said, excuse me? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm down there, you know, the area that I chose. And, and uh, I said, you got somebody down there growing marijuana in a damn Coleman cooler. Oh, man, he was livid. He's some kid lived off one of the entrances, was down in there. That was his excuse. But that was my last year at that club. Never killed anything, never saw anything. It was horrible. I was just a, one of those clubs where you get into and, and the camp was out in the open, there were no trees, it was just scalding hot in the summer, you couldn't do any work, just miserable, miserable place. But uh, you know, I kept the 3,000 acres, I never quit that, but uh, I went all over the state trying to find other places to hunt, and uh, back then I tried to get my buddy Richard, he could buy land that had been clear cut, the Georgia Pacific or Mead paperboard had clear cut, I mean, I mean clear cut, they took it right to the red clay. You could buy that land out there um, down in middle Georgia for about $250 an acre. And I told Richard, I was single. I had money coming out of my ears. I told Richard, I said, you know, let's go together and let's, let's buy some land and we'll have our own hunting club and we'll do, we'll plan it and we'll do what we want to do with it. Oh, he wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. He'd done it before and he said, uh, just, it's a mess. And 
you know, people leave and you got to try to settle up. And so we never did it. I moved out here to South Carolina. And then he calls me up and says, well, you're not going to believe what I did. I said, what would you do? He said, well, I bought some land. I said, son of a bitch, man. God. And yeah, he bought, uh, I can't remember what it was. He spent a fortune for it. With him and three other guys went together and bought some land. And built a little cabin on it. Made a little little uh, clubhouse. And they were hunting out of it. I said, man, that's what I wanted to do for so many years when I could have done it. And uh, he just refused. But, uh, yeah, well. We had one old guy, and uh, he was hunting in Talbot County, and he got into that club. And uh, he was a real old guy. He had uh, he was really down there. He didn't do a whole lot of hunting. He was really just down there to camp and then and, and hang out. But he had uh, he came back one evening. He was it was a Sunday evening. He was packing up, getting ready to go, and he uh, put his gun in on the pickup truck seat. It was a bench seat, straight back pickup truck. When he put it in there, he, it went off and shot through his door. It was loaded. He didn't know it. Um, so we were all like, oh, God. Well, you know, crap happens to everybody. So didn't think a whole lot of it. So he, uh, oh, a couple weeks later, he's coming back. Same thing. Gets into camp. And, uh. It's Saturday night, he's getting ready to go out. He's got one of these scabbards on his, his four-wheeler. And uh, so he's putting his rifle down in the scabbard and it goes off, shoots down through his rear tire, ricochets off the rim, goes up and blows his front tire out of his four-wheeler. And he looked around and I mean, we were all, you know, everyone was getting their stuff ready to go out and hunt and uh, it's right in the middle of all of us. And uh, we're like, holy crap. He says, well, fellas, he says, it's been fun, but he says, I think it's time for me to, to, to hang it up, stop hunting. Nobody disagreeing with him. He was going to shoot somebody or himself at some point in time, but that was the last time we saw him. It was a shame to see him go out like that. And, you know, we watched him come, we watched him go. So every year that I was in Georgia, I'd fly my father down from Pennsylvania, and he'd come down and... Uh, I'd take my vacation, and we'd spend 14 days down at the hunting camp. I had a little 18-foot camper. I started off in a tent. Horrendous. I'm too old for that crap. Went to sleep in the back of my pickup truck. Too old for that crap. And the uh, first time I flew my father down, I rented a, a little Class A motorhome. And we took that down. It was a dream. I was like a house. We had all the amenities. So I said, well, I'm buying a camper. So I bought a little 18-foot camper and uh, that I could tow down there. And the uh, thing was, was awesome. So the next year, I flew my dad down. We ran out of water on the second day, I think. It had a 20-gallon tank in it. And uh, so we're driving all over trying to find water. There was a plantation house up at the, the, the front of the road. I mean, this, this Talbot County is nothing but pine trees from one end to the other. One little tiny town called Talbotton. And uh, we drove down there, couldn't find any water, so we stopped at this um, uh, plantation, knocked on the door and, and told them, so could, you know, could we fill up a couple five-gallon jugs of water because we ran out. And uh, so they let us do that. And uh, boy, I tell you, we struggled. Then we started learning how to, how to conserve water. And uh, it wasn't long before, you know, I had... Uh, Fill up the 20 gallon tank in the camper, but then I'd have a 50 gallon tank um, or a 50 gallon drum, and I had a drum uh, stand that it sat in, and I could fill that tank up with. And we could shower, wash dishes, do everything, and, and but we learned how to conserve it, and it, it was in no time we just no trouble with the water at all, not even an issue. But, but that first year was tough. It, uh, he came down and, and uh, you know, some years we, good Lord, we'd kill five, six deer. Other years we'd get skunked. Um, I'd spend most of the summer getting ready for him to come down. I mean, I'm putting stands up. I'm trying to figure out where where they need to be. I'm trying to get him, you know, set up. Well, he's he's deaf and uh, very, very hard of hearing. This was before he had, even had a hearing aid. 
And uh, so I put them up in the stand. It was underneath a swamp white oak on a creek. Um, th th these acorns are huge. I mean, they're as big as your thumb. They're, they're huge. And uh, they're all over the ground and uh, deer everywhere. And they're dropping down into this creek. And uh, the creeks in Georgia are kind of strange. You, you know, they're, you got a flat bottom, and then they're just vertical sides, and then the stream runs and meanders through that. Very hard to find a place to cross. But I set them up in, in that stand right there on that creek, and uh, I went up on the edge of the of the bottom, and uh, right along the pine trees, and uh, I sat there, and uh, I had a little buck come down, a little six point. Okay, right underneath my stand. I watched him go right underneath me, heading right to my dad. And I could hear him in the leaves, crunch, crunch, crunch. I mean, loud as crap. And uh, it went all the way down. I'm like, any minute. I mean, it's going right to him. And I couldn't see my dad from where I was at. But I'm like, any minute, any minute, I'm going to hear boom. And uh, so he's got to be down there by now. And uh, all I hear is crunch, 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 crunch. And he comes tearing ass by me again, runs up into the pine trees. I said, Dad, why did you shoot that buck? He said, I didn't see a buck. I said, my God, he was coming right at you, making all kinds of noise. And that's when I realized his hearing was just, was gone. So I, I had a neighbor, um, old David Snyder, who was a, um, an ex-Marine sniper, and his hearing was shot. But he had these, um, I don't know where he got them from, but they had, they were like headphones, and they had two little micro, or, uh, not microphones, but little, um, I don't know what you feel. I guess they're microphones, but you could hear it would amplify the sound. I borrowed those, gave them to my dad. I put them on him the first time and turned them on, and he just, his face lit up, and he was like, wow. I said, yes, yeah. you'll, you'll hear them now. And uh, so the same kind of deal. I took them down to stand, put them up there, um, watched the deer come down, headed right to him, right to him. Almost got down to him, and then the deer turned and then went back up right where he came in. So it winded him or something. I was like, Dad, why didn't you shoot that deer? He said, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. And uh, I said, well, he had to have heard it. He says, oh, I turned that thing off. He says, damn squirrels and airplanes and everything making so much noise. He said, I couldn't take it. I'm like, oh, Lord. So he didn't kill one that year. Um, but we had a lot of fun. So it's some amazing stuff with my dad down there. And uh, one time we were moving a stand. I had these long homemade stands. They were made out of wood and two by fours and basically a platform with a, with a ladder on it. They were heavy, um, but very, very sturdy. And they had a swivel seat on them, a swivel bass seat on them, so you could move around and, and it was very comfortable. So we're down in that creek, you know, and it's, you know, we're down probably 10 feet down into this creek and we're going up the, the creek bed hauling the stand. I'm on the front with behind my back. My dad's got the back and he's got his rifle on him on his shoulder and I do too. Come around the corner and stop and look and there's a buck standing right up on the bank looking down at us. And I'm just standing there with this thing and I looked up to my dad I was like, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. So he puts it in a ladder down, pulls the gun up, pow, shoots that buck. The buck takes off running back down. No lie, that thing died about five feet from our four wheeler. We went up, we were laughing, and uh, like, man, if you you know put that shot a little bit further back, you would have ended up on the four wheeler, and we wouldn't even have to have loaded them. Uh, but that was an amazing, amazing shot. Another time we were coming up out of the creek bottom, we were just up on the edge, going up into the pines, and uh, we jumped a little, a little doe. It wasn't very big. Jumped it up, and I had my shotgun at the time with, with slugs in it because I was going to hunt some real thick stuff. And uh, that doe takes off, and it runs, kind of curl in front of us. And I shot three times, and that thing missed every single time. My dad's got the 270. He pulls up, shoots once, and rolls that thing. Hit it right behind the ear. Dead run. I mean, that thing was flat out, about a foot off the ground, just getting on it, and he just rolled that thing. Like, oh my God, how in the hell? I missed it three times. You shoot once and roll that damn thing. Some amazing stuff. But he, uh, you know, he was probably 65, 68 at this time. 
and I got them, you know, we had climbers, and we'd climb trees. My sister's just having a fit. I got four sisters, and uh, they uh, they all have fits, and I've got this old man climbing trees down there, you know, but this is this is what he loved, and, and uh, we both enjoyed this immensely this, this whole week. You forget you have a job. You know, you go down there, and, and all we would do is, is we'd get up early, crack at dawn, make coffee, a little bit of breakfast, we'd head out, um, you know, like 4.30 in the morning, get up in our stands, we'd hunt, um, we'd come back around 11, we'd have lunch, we'd take a nap, get up, you know, around 4.30, we'd head back out in the woods again. And uh, we'd come back in the evening, and we'd read deer hunting magazines and talk about what we saw and where we should move stands. And this is all we did for like 10 to 14 days. It was just amazing, amazing way to spend a vacation. He had a, um, it was a Model 94 Winchester, lever action. And I never, 30-30, I never liked that gun, but he, uh, we got it for him for, for Christmas one year. And uh, so he, a lot of deer that year, but every deer that he killed, he would shoot either in the ass or right through the, the back straps and tenderloins. And I'm like, Dad, what, what are you doing? And uh, he said, I'm aiming right at the shoulder. I'm like, that just this makes no sense. I'd take the gun down, we'd sight in it, sight in it, you know, seemed to be fine. So I gave him my 270, <coughs> which is a Browning. I let him use that. And uh, he's still, he's hitting deer in the ass. And he's hitting, I mean, he's just ruining tons and tons of meat. And uh, so he went and had it defouled. I guess it was really bad at the barrel. Um, so kid I grew up with was a gunsmith now, and uh, Smith's Custom Guns up in Warren, Pennsylvania. And he uh, defiled the barrel. I guess there's a lot of copper fouling in it, and uh, got it cleaned out. And then my dad went out behind his his gunsmithing shop and just plinked with a 22 all summer long. He'd just go up there once a week and shoot targets. He had the spinners and all that crap up there. And Made a huge difference. The next year came down, he's just rolling, just plugging right in the shoulder. But yeah, it was just, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was pulling it or what, but just that practicing with that 22, um, it made a world of difference and uh, really started to hammer him. But, uh, you know, growing up in Pennsylvania, um, I always wanted to hunt. And uh, I couldn't wait till I turned 12 years old where I could hunt. And uh, took my hunter safety course at the junior high school. Um, this is back when we had, they had rifling um, uh, clubs. We had a, there was a shooting range in the basement of the junior high and the, and the high school. And uh, it was nothing. The kids took shotguns to school and uh, you know carried them on the bus kept them in their locker, they hunt on the way home, you know, walking home, because high school's up on a hill, and woods all around, you know, and they'd walk back to their house, they hunt squirrel on the way home. Another kids had guns all the time, and every truck, pickup truck had guns in the back. Nobody ever killed anybody, it was amazing. And, uh, you know, we had no guns. We, did, we didn't own a single gun of any type or sort. And, uh, we were very poor. Um, I mean, my dad and my mom, my mom stayed home until my sister and I were, I don't know, probably 10, something like that. And she went to work at the refinery in town. But uh, I had four sisters. So there's five kids, you know, my mother, my dad. Um, we, uh, we just never had enough money to, to ever buy. So we, you know, I got 12 years old. And my dad hadn't hunted since 1954. That was the last license that he had. And I think I've still got that license in my cabinet over here. But uh, so he said, well, I guess I'm gonna have to, to, to get a gun. And uh, so we would borrow guns from people. We had all kinds of different stuff. I've used everything you can imagine. Just whatever anybody would loan us, you know, we, we used to deer hunt. and. Uh, first year when I was 12, my dad, you know, bought me a 30-30. Uh, 
It was a Western Auto Marlin 3030, and uh, he'd found it, a guy that had won it in a fiddling contest. And, uh, but he, he didn't hunt and didn't need it, so he uh, was sold it. He sold it to my dad for $80. I've still got that gun, love it. It's an amazing rifle, and uh, killed countless deer with that thing. And, uh, but, uh, so we would, my grandfather, you know, he had, uh, they had a farm up in uh, Ripley, New York, 50 acres. It was just my dream. I mean, I went up there all the time, killed rabbits for him all summer long, pulled weeds, just helped him out a couple weeks every summer. And, uh, but he had guns and uh, we'd borrow some, but he was, you know, very particular about getting them back. And, and uh, so I would borrow his 16 gauge and uh, we'd hunt. Uh, rough grouse, we'd hunt uh, squirrels and stuff. It was really nice. It's an old deer field. And he had some deer rifles, and we would borrow those. So I would take these, all the guns that you know he would loan us, and uh, I would, uh, I'd clean them up. I would re-blue the barrels. I'd strip the stocks down, refinish stocks. You know, just clean these things until they were absolutely immaculate, and. Uh, and then I, he, he'd come down, and you could tell he's, he's so used to people up running a farm that would just you know, use them and throw them back in the in the um, in the deer in the rifle case and not oil them. They'd be all rusty. You know, it made him very angry. Um, but every time he got one back from me, it was always just immaculate, in far better condition than it was when I, when we borrowed it. And uh, and then that went on for years and years and years. And then finally he came down. He'd gotten pretty old. Um, he came down one time and uh, to visit, and uh, he came in with a whole arm full of guns. He brought them all in, set them all out on the uh, uh, dining room table. And he said, I'm giving all these to you. He said, you're the only one that seems to want to take care of these things. And he said, so I'm giving them to you. So I got every single one of his guns. And uh, I've still got every single one of the ones he gave me. They, to me... They don't belong to me. They're his guns. I'm just taking care of them. Uh, but in those guns, he had um, stuff that belonged to my my great uncles, um, his older brother, um, Oscar, uh, who was a wealthy guy, and uh, 257 Roberts, 12 gauge, um, with a, a choke that you could change the uh, the choke manually on. Uh, I've got his 22 target. I've got his. Um, uh, 4570, um, which is a carbine, is a, a Springfield old cavalry rifle. A uh, bunch of 20 gauges. Uh, I've just got them all and shoot them and keep them in really, really nice condition. And uh, to me, they don't belong to me. I'm going to pass them on. Um, hopefully, somebody in my family will uh, appreciate them the way that I do. Um, but. Uh, I said, we never, never really had anything. My dad bought me a 20 gauge, a Ted Williams 20 gauge for, uh, for Christmas. It was from Sears. And uh, it was something you won't see anymore. And uh, loved that 20 gauge. And we shot squirrels with that. Um, my dad used my grandpa's 12 gauge. And we'd, uh, we did all right doing that. Uh, it really gave me an appreciation, you know, for for the guns and, and uh, taking care of stuff and making sure that anything that you borrow, you know, you, you give it back in better condition than, than what you got it. And uh, I've, I've, that's been my my mantra ever since, and uh, it'll, it'll serve you well if you, if you do that. Um, and I'm very careful who I loan stuff to, just like my grandfather was. He was, you know, he knew you had what gun, and, and he was coming back to get it. He'd, uh, he'd call up and say, I want that, I want that 16 gauge back. And, you know, he'd open up that case and roll that thing open and I'd taken the trigger guard and it was had it's like a heavy, heavy enamel on it, like a black enamel and it was chipped and it was all crap. It was like a pewter, almost like an aluminum, just punk, you know, metal, it's crap. But I took that and I polished that with real fine steel wool until it just gleamed like, like bright silver. And once I got it polished up and I kept it covered with, um, with uh, grease, and uh, it was gorgeous, and that, that gun looked great. Still got it in the safe. Um, 
my son took it out just a couple weekends ago to shoot with a girlfriend he's got. But uh, very, very fortunate to have all those things, all those family guns. Um, a lot of them got lost. Got my dad's brothers, and one of them was always uh, at the mind that, you know, how much is something worth? How much can you sell it for? And then I said, I'm never going to sell these things. So, well, that's an expensive gun you got there. I said, yeah, I know it is, but I said, it's never going to get sold. And, uh, but all the ones that my great uncle had that, that my dad's brothers got, got sold off, which is a shame. I really would love to have all those things. Um, I hear stories about all these rifles that they had and what they used. And the, uh, the 4570, you know, my grandfather told me about that. He says he bought that for $3 when he was 13 years old from a drunk Polak. And uh, he said he, uh, it's, it hung in the barn on, on the two nails. And whenever somebody needed a gun to, to, um, to hunt deer with, that's one that they go and they let them use it. The old trap door type with the big old, you know, rollback um, hammer on it. And uh, never shot that thing. I'm scared to death of it, but I've completely redone it. Got a new stock for it. And uh, it's beautiful stuff. Um, very, very happy to have all that, all those weapons. A uh, little bit of family history. Um, it's just a, it's an honor to, to keep them in good work and order and to, and to go out and, and shoot them. My great uncle's 257 Roberts, I've taken that out, killed deer with that. Um, it was uh, very blessed to, to have gotten all those.